started. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing one of our own docents as our speaker. While he was working as a scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, Dr. Paul Swanson answered an ad for a partnership in a 60-foot wooden sloop. Or schooner, I'm sorry. Okay. Fortunately for us, that partnership survived two boats and 30 years. He and his wife Sandy have chartered boats all over the world, but many of those years were spent cruising Channel Islands National Park in their own private boat. During that time, Paul built a vast knowledge and photographic history of the islands. And tonight, he's going to take us on an armchair tour of what he calls the best kept secret in Southern California. So let's give a warm welcome to Paul Swanson. Uh, thank you. Is this working? Uh, can you hear me? Can clear in the back? Okay. I don't want to have to talk too loud. Um, gee, this is a great crowd. Uh, contrary to all the rumors, we're not giving away free money. <laughs> um, Jerry, I think, uh, said everything pretty well. I, I spent many, many years cruising the Channel Islands, and I have a nice photographic history of it. And so you're going to be... Take an armchair tour, kind of a Rick Steves type tour of the islands. It's slanted toward boaters. If you're not a boater, maybe it'll prompt you to get a boat. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, so I'm going to talk about mostly the anchorages in the water. I mean, after all, this is a maritime museum. So that's what we're going to concentrate on. Now, what you see up there is the arch. The arch is the icon, really, of the Channel Islands. That's just on the east of Anacapa. I have several books which I will call your attention to. You can't see it from back there. But this is Brian Fagan's Cruising Guide to the Channel Islands. And this particular one, this is 1988, this is out of print, I think, years ago. Uh, the later cruising guides are sort of the whole West Coast, the, the, the Fagan ones are the whole West Coast, so they give a much smaller, less shorter shift to the Channel Islands. So this one is just the Channel Islands. It's very, very detailed. So if you can get this in a used bookstore, this is really your guide. The other book that I recommend is a book by Marlon Daly. Marlon Daly is sort of the definitive uh, uh, chronicler of the Channel Islands. She knows the history of the islands better than anyone. And this is California's Channel Islands, 1,001 Questions Answered. They're just little one-liners. And I used this a lot when I was a docent for the Park Service. I just would, when I was on a particular island, I would read that section on that island. I want to know how high the peak is, how many square miles the, the island is. All that stuff is right at your fingertips. And I have a third book, and I'll talk about that a little later when we come to that part of the, of the uh, <clears throat> talk. I can get the buttons right here. <clears throat> These are the islands... People think, the people that live up here, think of these four northern islands as being the Channel Islands. Actually, there are, there are eight Channel Islands. There's four islands up here, uh, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa. And then, of course, in south, there's San Clemente, or Santa Catalina, which everybody's heard of Santa Catalina. Tiny little Santa Barbara Island here, and then the two Navy Islands, um, uh, San Clemente and San Nicolas. And these islands are quite difficult to get to unless you have some connection with the military. All the other ones are actually easily accessible by boat, and Catalina and Santa Cruz by commercial vessel. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a uh, picture, actually, I borrowed from the Park Service. It shows the currents from the north. This guy, by the way, goes all the way from uh, San Luis Obispo County line down here to the Mexican border. There's a uh, current that comes down from the north, a cold current. The water is deep, has low salinity and high oxygen. And that's coming down all the way down the coast, driven by the, uh, the prevailing northwest winds. 
up from Mexico, you have a called the California countercurrent. That is warm water, uh, very salty, with low oxygen, and it's on the surface. And those two currents meet right here off the channel, off the northern channel islands, and it causes a big gyre in the water. And in these two currents meeting, some for some reason, which I don't fully understand, but it makes it very, very uh, desirable for the fish, the sea life. So this area is extremely rich in sea life. The sea life thing, of course, supports the birds and the animals and everything else. So this is often referred to as the Galapagos of the north. You, When you go to other places, we were up at Puget Sound here not too long ago, and say, gee, there isn't much around here as far as animals are concerned. I mean, there's whales, but other, you don't see many birds, you don't see many sea lions, but here you just see them all the time, dolphins and, and all sorts of things. I'm going to talk about the boats that we <clears throat> that we cruised on over this long period of time. <clears throat> this is the Albatross. The Albatross is a 60-foot staysail schooner. And up in the corner, uh oh, I was looking for the laser and not the uh, not the knob. I'll get it. Up in the left-hand corner is my boat partner, Ted. And Ted is standing here right in front of us. Ted, turn around and sh sh <laughs> show everybody. Uh, started in 1979, and of course that's Sandy and I in, uh, in when Sandy, before Sandy got blonde hair. <laughs> And uh, the boat is anchored in an air, in a little cove on north part of Santa Cruz Island called Orizaba, which probably no one ever heard of. It's not even on the charts anymore, but it's in Brian Fagan's book. And uh, it's, a, it's a good hurricane hole. This is the Asmara. I bought the Asmara in 1993. It was about 10 years old at that, that, at that time. And it's a 53-foot all-male catch plastic boat, much more modern than the schooner. The schooner was built in 1935, so it was quite elderly. <laughs> This is our present boat. Uh, by the way, there's something a matter with the aspect ratio there. They're all kind of scrunched in. Jerry, is that fixable? Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter, but uh, the boat is longer than that. <laughs> uh, this is a 40-foot trawler, a diesel-powered trawler, and uh, it's a Pacific trawler made up in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we bought that in 2012 and, uh, and have it to this day. I'm going to start with Catalina Island, and we'll do this fairly quickly because everybody knows about Catalina, and many of you have been there. The, uh, the anchorage is in the coves. Avalon, of course, is part of the city of uh, Los Angeles. It's a real town. Uh, farther down, there are two harbors, so it's Isthmus Harbor on this side and Catalina Harbor on the back side, collectively called two harbors. Place up here that you can really only get by a boat called Emerald Bay. And lesser known on the far side of the island is a place called Little Harbor. Quite a delightful anchorage that not too many people get to. This is Avalon. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, a lot of you have been there. You can take ferry boats over there just for a day trip. This is Isthmus Harbor. This is uh, one of the, the northern part of the of two harbors. Uh, you rarely see it with that few boats. This was probably a very old picture. <laughs> and that's Emerald Bay. Emerald Bay then is farther up. This is a modern picture. This is off actually of the uh, off the Proud Mary, the trawler, because I can tell the, by the flags. Um, Emerald gets its name from it has a white sandy bottom, and then the water is very very clear there. And then on a sunny day, the uh, the blue water reflects off the white sandy bottom and it has this gorgeous emerald color. It's just a it's just a beautiful harbor, well protected. And this is Catalina Harbor on the backside. And it's a little harder to get to Catalina Harbor. You have to go around the island, so not very many people go there. And this is about as many boats as you'll ever see in Catalina Harbor. Cat Harbor is generally called. Uh, and it's, you can always find a mooring there, and it's very peaceful. So it's, very, it's deep, so it's well protected. There's never any swell in there. And this is Little Harbor. This is the one hardly anybody ever goes to. There's the schooner at anchor in Little Harbor. It has a nice beach. 
This is an aerial view. I have quite a number of these. These are satellite pictures. They're all oriented the same way with north up, so you can kind of figure out you know, where things are. Um, a couple of important things. The Anchorage, this is the beach over here in the Anchorage. This part of, the, of Cat Harbor, I mean Little Harbor is the Anchorage. This part is not. The, the prevailing winds are from the northwest in this whole area. So they're not, the winds come in from up here. And there's a big reef that comes out, and that protects this part of it. So there's really no swell back in there. But here, if you were to anchor over here, it's open to the ocean. The other thing is, is right there called Big Rock. It's not named Big Rock. It is a big rock. <laughs> and the big rock uh, at low tide just pokes out of the water, and a high tide is just covered. And several boats have met their fate on that rock. So when one comes into Little Harbor, it's on the charts, but you have to be aware it's there. You, you usually cannot see it because it's usually submerged. It's quite dangerous. So you don't want to anchor over here anyway. You want to go back and anchor back there. On to Santa Barbara Island. Santa Barbara Island only has only one place to land. Uh, you could anchor probably more than one place. Again, the prevailing winds from the northwest, so you really want to anchor on this side. But this is really the only good anchorage, and this is the only way to get on the island. There's a dock there, and you can pull up. It's called Landing Cove. The uh, several other interesting things. I never find a laser button there. This whole beach down here is a sea lion rookery. So you can walk from Landing Cove. This is very small, by the way. It's only a mile and a half across. It's a little bitty island. And it's got about five miles of hiking trails on it. So you can see the whole thing in one day. But you can walk down here on this beach and look down. It's, oh, 100 feet or so down to the beach and see the sea lion rookery in the spring. And thousands of sea lions down there. And over in this little cove over here, you got to walk down a pretty steep hill, but this is an elephant seal rookery. And I remember Ted and I and Sandy taking the dinghy around one time there, the elephant seals, and we were in too close, and all of a sudden, out of the water, came this absolutely enormous thing. I mean, it was twice as big as the dinghy. <laughs> Went whooshing by. <laughs> so we thought maybe we're a little too close to the, to the land. A uh, little island over here called Suto Island, and you can go around the whole thing in a dinghy in an hour or so. This is the landing. Uh, this is again an old sign, and uh, you'll see that you see there's a it's been pasted over that. It probably said National Monument because it's become a park in the 70s or 80s. I'm not exactly sure when, but it had been a national monument. This is the ranger station as it originally was. Uh, it was just an old Quonset hut. So when we first started boating up there, that's uh, where the rangers were. This is the new ranger station. <coughs> it's much nicer. And there's a little museum over in this end, around this side, there's a little museum. This is the bunkhouse for the uh, visiting scientists and volunteers. And the other half is the ranger's quarters. There's a full-time ranger out there, or there used to be. I think there still is. There's not much vegetation on Santa Barbara. There's Coreopsis, uh, shown on the foreground, and then beaver tail cactus coming up that canyon. It was heavily grazed back in the, well, starting in the 20s and 30s, and on up through the 50s. It was very heavily grazed. And I don't know if it ever had any trees on it, but there's certainly no trees today. This is the uh, Coreopsis. If you're not familiar with Coreopsis, it looks dead uh, most of the year. And people, visitors would come, you know, when I was working with the Park Service. Uh, I, I volunteered for about 10 years and after my first retirement job for the Park Service. And I was a docent and a natural, a naturalist and tour guide on the islands. And the people would say, what are all those dead plants there and why don't you chop them down? Well, they're not dead, they're just resting. But in two weeks of the year, they look like this. And they bloom and they're just beautiful. Beautiful. And then there's a crystal and ice plant. This, the Park Service doesn't like this. It's invasive. It's not native to the island, so they actually get rid of the ice plant. They, they, they simply hoe it out. In some places, they've succeeded in getting rid of it. Uh, some of the local denizens, uh, one period when I was over there for a few days, uh, they were nesting. Uh, young sea lions frolicking down in the landing cove. Landing cove was a very favorite place for sea lions. You'll always see sea lions down there. 
And I walked down one, one morning, down to the dock early in the morning, and this little female sea lion was sleeping with her nose right up against the pier, you know, on the board. And I walked up, and she woke up and, and looked at me like, <laughs> very plainly, but I just love the picture. There's, there's your ranger in the Coriopsis. <laughs> Okay, on to Anacapa Island. We're now in the northern Channel Islands. <laughs> Anacapa is actually made up of three islands, uh, cleverly called West Anacapa, Middle Anacapa, and East Anacapa. <laughs> uh, seems like they could have had a little bit more imagination, but uh, uh, there's only two places you can land. There's Landing Cove down here, and there is a little dock, and uh, you can't leave your boat there, but you can drop people off. And the island packers, uh, the commercial group that comes out there, will dump you off at the dock, and the park service uses that. There's another place up here called Frenchies, just a little beach. You can't really go anywhere. This island, by the way, West Anacapa, is off limits. About 80% of the western, or the, I'm sorry, the, the great pelicans, brown pelicans, nest on Anacapa. West Anacapa Island. And they don't want people up there you know, disturbing the pelicans. Uh, but you can land in French's Cove, and I have one picture of that. And otherwise, you land on East Anacapa, and you can just go down to here. You can't get any farther. In fact, right there is as far as you can get. And that's called Inspiration Point, and you can look this direction, and lots of calendars and lots of pictures show that view from Inspiration Point. It's really quite nice. This is again the aerial view of the east end, I'm uh, sorry, uh, east end, yes, of Anacapa. This is Landing Cove right in here. So this is actually the cove and the little dock. And there's a path that comes up. <coughs> These buildings were built by the Lighthouse Service back in the 20s. This is the lighthouse out here. And uh, you can see there's, there's a house here. There was a house here, 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 and here. Those were actually torn down by the lighthouse service. When they left in the 1960s, they automated the light. And, and they don't have any more manned lighthouses. So the lighthouse service picked up, and they said, well, we're going to put the island back to its natural state. So they started tearing down the houses. Well, the park service, which was taking the island over, and immediately you know, said, stop, stop. You know, we want those houses. So they saved one. They save this one. They save this is the uh, machine shop, and this is the little, it's a bunkhouse and museum now. And this one actually is their power station. So they did save one house, which the ranger lives in, but the rest of them were all destroyed by accident. <laughs> this is what it looks like. As you walk up the path, this is the museum over here in the bunkhouse on this side. This is the machine shop. And this is solar panels and batteries and things like that. There's Sandy and I at the light pool. You can see the Coriopsis in bloom. Anacapa is probably the nicest place to see the Coriopsis. It's just beautiful in the spring. But you've got a very narrow window, only just a few weeks when it's blooming. We just happen to hit it right. And you can see the purple um, ice plant and then the yellow coreopsis and the green, uh, yellow flowers and the green coreopsis. And the colors are just beautiful. Here we are walking. That's uh, Gerard's uh, we're walking with. Yeah. Ted and Polly know them. And you can see how, the, how big the, uh, they're about almost five feet high. So that's why they call them giant coreopsis. They get pretty big. There are stories on Santa Barbara Island. They cleared the Coriopsis are over it for the, the early ranchers did. They talk about Coriopsis being 10 feet tall. I've never seen any that big in recent years, but apparently at one time it, there was Coriopsis that was that tall. There's the ice plant. This ice plant has pretty much all been taken out. Uh, but it's beautiful when it blooms, but it's, it's invasive and the Park Service doesn't like it. This is Frenchy's Cove. This is one of the things you see in the water. This is a ship that was wrecked in the 50s, I believe. Uh, I don't know, is Don Mills here? He, he, he told me when it was wrecked. Uh, the ship, is, it was built in the 20s. It's got this big old six-cylinder engine, huge. It's the whole thing. When you see the children there, it's like 15 feet long. It's this enormous big old engine. It came out of a, of a small ship. It was wrecked in Frenchy's Cove. And at low tide, you can see that engine. It's really interesting. Okay, we're going to go on to Santa Cruz. And 
Santa Cruz is probably the most interesting of all the islands. It's the most varied, and it's got the most anchorages. This is a little bit different kind of a map this time. It just What we're going to look at is each one of those yellow spots is a popular anchorage. It's not all the anchorages. There's still more, but these are the most popular ones and ones that we've been to. This end of the island is, belongs to the Park Service. This end of the island belongs to the Nature Conservancy. And I didn't tell you at the beginning, I meant to, the, five, the, the four northern islands, right off the channel out here that we can see, and Santa Barbara Island are all national parks. Right? Catalina is owned by the Santa Catalina Island Company and the Catalina Conservancy. About 80% of it's owned by the Conservancy. And uh, uh, Prigley took that land that he owned and, and turned it into a conservancy. And then the rest of it, the Catalina Island Company owns the coves and the isthmus. Avalon is owned by the city of Los Angeles. And the other two islands then are belong to the Navy. San Miguel, the farthest western island, not on the northern one, technically belongs to the Navy, but it's turned it over to the Park Service for administration. But they could get it back any time they want it. So, anyway, this is... Uh and this is the, the only thing that's not owned by the Park Service, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, this island, these two of these islands, Santa Rosa and Santa, <laughs> Santa Cruz, were given by Spanish or by Mexican land grants to Curls of the Revolution. They gave lots of land there. So it was owned initially by two Mexicans. Then after the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe, and this became part of California and part of the federal, part of the United States, then there was a Supreme Court decision that those original land grants were valid. So these two islands continued to be privately owned. The rest of the islands were never owned by any, but they were owned by Mexicans, and then they became owned by the state of California and then the federal government. But these two islands were privately owned. This one was bought well, the, from the two Mexican owners. It was bought right after the Civil War by a person named Justinian Kerr. Justinian Kerr wanted to have this little fiefdom, a self-contained agricultural community. And he did that for 50 or 60 years and was quite successful. There's a ranch in the central, there's a big central valley here, a big rift that runs all the way through the island. Central Valley is the main ranch. But the island is so big, he had to have little satellite ranches. And there was a number of them. And the ones that still exist are Scorpion, Smugglers, Christie's out here, and then the Central Ranch, and then uh, there's a one building, I think, here at Del Norte. I've never been there to that one. Uh, and some of the other ranches were, are, are just, there's nothing left. They're all gone. Uh, the, after the care sold the land, uh, they sold it to a person named uh, this part of the island uh, by... Edwin Stanton, his son Cary Stanton, which many, many people knew. Cary Stanton owned it up until the 1980s, and he eventually then sold it to the Nature Conservancy because he didn't want the Park Service to get it. He was kind of of a curmudgeon. So anyway, so that's kind of the that's kind of a very brief history of this island. This is uh, Scorpion Anchorage we'll look at first. Uh, scorpion Anchorage is really two anchorages, big scorpion here, little scorpion here. The prevailing northwest winds, this is by far the best anchorage because the swell and the, and the wind is broken up by that little island. That's called Scorpion Rock, not very big. And the, <clears throat> the, the ranch, building is right in here. A little hard to see it in this picture. Uh, there, is a, there is a pier, a little pier right here. You can land on the pier, but you can't leave your boat there. You can just let people off. And then uh, there's roads that run here. This runs over to smugglers. This road goes up on the hillside and comes back. And then the, uh, the old ranch site is right in here, which you'll see a picture of in just a minute. That's just <clears throat> the sign on the beach. And this is the ranch from the beach looking inward. This is from up on top of that hill called uh, Cavern Point, looking down on the anchorage. And you can see this is a uh, little scorpion here and big scorpion here. See, it's quite busy. These two boats are island packers boats. They're 90-foot catamarans, and they'll take people over to the island. We'll talk about that later. 
kayakers there, and uh, they sort of have a kayaking school. These boats are fairly small boats. They're probably just there for the day. The people that are there for an extended period of time, and their bigger boats are down here in Little Scorpion, which is the preferred anchorage. <laughs> This is the adobe. They did a major restoration on it in the 90s, I guess. Uh, it's really quite nice. It's a museum now. Uh, you can go in the whole bottom. The floor is open. Uh, and it has some interesting exhibits. This is the bunkhouse. This is where the family lived in the adobe. And then the, the vaqueros lived in the, in the bunkhouse. A lot of old machinery lying around. It's an old truck. Uh, I can't read the name of it on it. But uh, And then uh, this is the blacksmith house, blacksmith shop, an old crawler tractor, a little WD-40 and some yellow paint. You could probably make a run again. <laughs> this is the ranger quarters, uh, and this is just one of them. They're served with these little houses. They're just bedrooms is what they are. But visitors uh, that come over the island, uh, when I was a volunteer, I would stay in one of these. Sandy stayed over, I guess, uh, one, one weekend, I think. And uh, they have visiting scientists, all sorts of people come over. And I was just looking up Scorpion Canyon. It was just a beautiful day one day. There's a double rainbow, actually. You can see the second. Oops. Uh-oh. I can't get quite used to the buttons. Oh. Okay, we're going to jump ahead. We're at Prisoners. <laughs> uh, uh, prisoners is the next one up around. We're going counterclockwise around the island. Prisoners also has a pier. And it has a dinghy dock. So you can actually take your dinghy, get off without getting your feet wet, and, uh, and leave your dinghy there. So that's the advantage of going to Prisoners. It has a not very nice beach. It's not a sandy beach. It's a very rocky beach. Uh, there's, a, there's a road that goes up into the Central Valley. That when they had the ranch there that operates during Cairn, Cairn's days. This is where they would offload the stuff. They had wool, uh, wine, uh, grape on the wine, and olives, and maybe one or two other crops that they would export from the island. And there are two warehouses right here. I have a better picture of in a minute. Yeah, that's looking from the water, looking at those two big warehouses. They're made out of bricks. They made bricks on the island. And uh, there's a date on them. Does anybody know the date? Uh, 1870, something like that. It's quite old. Um, they're just used for, for storage now. And there you can see the pier over here. Okay, we're going on up to Pelican. Pelican is Sandy's favorite anchorage. You can't really read it from here, but it says Pelican. This is Pelican from the air. You can see a boat there anchored, another boat coming in, probably looking for an anchorage. Um, well, I like to anchor over here close to this wall. Other people like to tuck back down in here. But again, the northwest prevailing winds, this is the best protected. Historically, this is a really interesting place because right along here, and I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, and a little bit out on this thing, there was a hotel back in the 19, well, from the teens on to about 1930. So it's a hotel owned by people named uh, Eaton, Margaret Eaton. Uh, Margaret Eaton wrote a book called Diary of a Sea Captain's Wife. And I highly recommend this book. Uh, she, was a, she wasn't a writer. It's basically more of a diary. But then she had some help. I goes writing it. But it's very well written and a very straightforward style. And it talks about the history of the island in that period of time. Her husband was kind of a scallywag. And uh, she talks about him. She's quite nice to him. Uh, but uh, but his reputation was uh, was not such a great guy. But anyway, they ran this little hotel over there for a number of years, and it burned down in, I don't know, the, before the war, anyway. It had a fire. So this, but there's a, some foundation, there's some bricks, and there's some stairs. And right down here in the water, you can't tell from this picture, there's a big flat thing. There was a landing there. And when we first started going over there, there were stairs cut into the wall and a nice railing. You could just be very easily walk up it. It's eroded so badly now it's it's actually hard to do it. This is from up on top where the hotel was looking back across the bay. <coughs> the big anchorage. There's the Proud Mary anchored in front of that far western wall. It's a beautiful patterns in it. Uh, so we'd like to anchor there and just sit and look at that. 
it's very artistic. This is how you have to get on the island. Uh, it's, uh, I should have showed you that. And this is around, just to the right, around that little point, because there's no real easy way to land now where the old landing used to be because it's so eroded. So people land in this beach and then walk around. There's an oak tree that, uh, this again, this was taken many years ago. You can't see so well in this picture, but there are initials carved in the tree various places. And I'll get one. This is closer. You can see this is a boat name, Alligator 63, 64, 65. You can even get close to it. And I say the, the tree is pretty dead. But it's an interesting history of people that visit the island. A lot of, when the hotel was there, a lot of Hollywood people would came up. And many people had big cruising boats. You know, Hollywood stars had big cruising boats in those days. And this was a place they could get away to. You know, the paparazzi could not really get to this island very easy. So, Okay, we're going on up to Fry's Harbor. This is Fry's from the air. And uh, yeah, the beach goes on around. There's a shadow across it. The beach goes all the way around here. Fry's is pretty small, but the Yacht Club, uh, Inventory Yacht Club, got 22 boats in there one year. We really had to shoehorn them in, but nobody hit anybody. This is this is the beach. The beach is never. I've never seen Fry's with a sandy beach. Fry's always has, has this pebble, pebbly beach, but it's really quite a pretty anchorage. But the most interesting thing about Fry's is Fry's was where they quarried all the rock for the Santa Barbara breakwater back in probably the 30s, Ted. I, I think uh, I don't know the exact year, but anyway, there was a, the remains of a quarries, railroad tracks where they had some kind of a little car running around. There's beams and iron and cables and just various junk. You used to be able to walk up the canyon. Again, it's too overgrown now to get up, but there's a remains of the cabins up there where the, uh, where the workers lived that were running the quarry. Okay, on to uh, ladies. Ladies is a very small anchorage. And this is for the air. This is ladies, and this is called little ladies over here. Uh, people do go in there. I, I, I would, it would scare me. That's pretty small. Even this is pretty small. And if you come in from the west, you look in there, and it doesn't look like there's any anchorage at all. And all of a sudden, you get around the corner, and it opens up. But it's, it's, there's only room for like three boats in there, and there's three boats right now. Maybe you could get four in, but it's pretty small. And you need two anchors. You need to anchor on the beach and anchor uh, on the bow. Uh, this is uh, Cueva Valdez. Yeah, Valdez is a person's name. Cave, Cueva is cave. And so this is again for the air. But if you look, the beach again because of the shadow. The beach extends clear over to here. Uh, it's usually a pretty nice beach. It's alternately some years it's it's pebbly and some years it's sandy. Uh, but right in this area, right in here, there's a cave that goes in here and comes out here. So you land your dinghy in the cave and then walk around onto the beach. Right? And it's always super calm. And I always call it, say, this is, a, this is a beach that was designed at Disneyland. It's so picturesque. It's, uh, and you can see in this picture, uh, and this is, the, this is the whole beach, and this is the entrance to the cave right here. And it comes out over here. This is from inside looking out, and that's the, the Proud Marriott anchored. This must have been a club cruise. There's quite a few boats out there. There's usually not that many. And that's uh, Cueva Valdez from, uh, from up on the hillside. And this is the entrance to the cave right here uh, from the beach. You just walk down the beach. And it's big. I mean, it's, a, it's the size of this room, the entrance to the cave. It's, it's quite large. Okay, on to Painted Cave. This is not an anchorage, but it's a not-to-miss place if you're there. Uh, this is reputed to be what is the biggest sea cave in the United States, and some people think it may be the biggest sea cave in the world. Uh, it's 1,600 feet deep, and that's the entrance to it. It's 150 feet high at the entrance. And you see one of those, those Packers catamarans, or 90-foot catamarans. Two times I've been in there on the Packers where they've backed that boat about 300 feet into the cave. 
<laughs> it's quite exciting. There's not much clearance on either side, but they, they were able to back it in. It has to be a real calm day. Uh, and there's no place to anchor here, so you have to you either have to keep your big boat outside and send the dinghy in, or in this case, I think we brought our dinghies up from Cueva Valdez. It's about a mile and a half, and it's, it's a nice little dinghy ride. That's inside, looking straight back. And you get back, this is probably from two-thirds of the way in. You look back to this, this last entrance, and, then, and it turns a sharp right, and it's real dark back there. And there's a, there's a beach, and there's always sea lions on that beach. And as soon as you get back there in your dinghy, the sea lions put up this great howl, dive in the water. <laughs> Okay, on around the corner to to Forney's. Uh, there's not much else. Nothing between. No anchorage is because of the prevailing winds. Now remember, the prevailing winds are from the northwest. So Forney's right in here. You have pretty good protection for the northwest winds. There's the view. The anchorage is right in this area in here. There's a very nice beach. Over here, there's uh, down about here some places the old Christie Ranch, but the part, oops, <laughs> but the uh, it's just a conservancy property, and the conservancy doesn't want you to go to Christie Ranch. There's big signs that say keep away. It's well preserved, I think, and they don't want people uh, bothering it. <laughs> it's a really nice beach over here. Very beautiful sandy beach here, but again, the swell comes in, so there's a pretty big swell there, not a very good swimming beach. This is looking toward the north. Uh, you can see where the boats are anchored behind those rocks. There's some structures there. I have no idea about the history of these. There was a stone house there at one time, but I don't know anything about the history of it. And again, in the water, you often see things like this. This is a piece of machinery off the shipwreck. Okay, and there's really nothing between Forney's and down here. There's no, there are no anchorages and no good anchorages. Uh, this is Willows right here. And then just past Willows is Coaches Prietos. We'll talk about Coaches in a little more detail. This is Willows. It's a very pretty spot. Uh, there are no willows there. I don't know how it got its name. They may have been at one time. <laughs> uh, there's also, I mean, this is the anchorage right in here. But there's also an anchorage over in here. This is in Brian Fagan's book. I talk about this. There's actually some cases a better anchorage in this center part. And a beautiful beach. You know, quite, you know, very, very nice sand on that beach. And well protected from the northwest. There are fairly high hills right in here. And this is uh, years ago. You can see the uh, you can see the schooner over here parked in that central anchorage. This is the trip that Jim and Michelle Sand and I took and met you guys in Ventura. Right? Yeah, that's Sandy uh, wading in the water there. They say there's nobody there. It was deserted. We're the only people. Uh, these are these places on the back side. This far out, hardly anybody goes because it's just harder to get to. The next one is Coaches Prietos, and you probably can't read it. It's C O C H E S P R I E T O S. Coaches Prietos. It sounds vaguely Spanish, doesn't it? But yet you look in a Spanish dictionary, you won't find any such words. Right? And it means black pigs. That's even worse, because if you translate black pigs out of Spanish, it's not coaches, we're not even close to coaches prietos. <laughs> so what does that word mean and where did it come from? Well, it turns out in the, in the Justinian Care ranching days, the, the people came from everywhere. There were, of course, a lot of Mexicans. There were Portuguese because there were a lot of Portuguese fishermen. There were Chinese because the Chinese came over to work on the railroads and the gold fields and a lot of them around. There were Japanese fishermen. There were Scandinavians. And they all lived and worked on this island in complete isolation, almost complete isolation. And they developed their own pidgin language. Little wor words from everything. So on Santa, particularly on Santa Cruz, you'll find place names of words that don't make any sense to you at all. You know, say, well, what is that word? What's the word in that word? The word in that word is probably a Portuguese word pronounced by a, by a Chinese, right? <laughs> and 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 so then and then and then spelled by a, by an English speaking person. And so uh, so coaches prietos. That's how that word originated in some manner like that. It means nothing in any modern language. <laughs> 
This is Coaches from the Air. Uh, this is probably the nicest beach on all of, of uh, Santa Cruz Island. By the way, i, I got to watch my time here. And this is just a beautiful Vero Sandy Beach. You see one boat right anchored in metal. There is a, a few people like to anchor over here. Again, the prevailing winds, well, they kind of curl around sometimes. But there is a, uh, there's a reef that comes out here. And the reef breaks up a little bit of swell that comes in from the south. So this part in here is always very calm. And I used to always like to anchor there. And there's the schooner anchored in exactly that spot, calm as can be. And I think, I don't know, it's been a number of years ago now, but Ted and I were there, I think at 2 o'clock in the morning, the wind came up fiercely and, and, and drove us out. And, of course, we were behind the reef. We had two anchors out. So now I anchor further out on a single anchor. <laughs> so I've, got, I've gotten cautious in my old age. But you see how beautiful the beach is. And this is quite a, of, of the, all the anchorages on the south side of the island, this is the one that people go to. Uh, this is a club cruise one weekend in the summer. Uh, you can see how crowded it is. Uh, and you people that are here from the Ventura Yacht Club, that's Hunter Leary and one of the Leap Girls. So this is taking Hunter's out of college now. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is quite a few years ago. But it, very, very busy. And this is the beach. <laughs> you, know, you know, it looks like Coney Island. <laughs> it's hard, hardly deserted at all. But this was particular. That's the most successful cruise we ever had over there, I think. Okay, on to the last one on this island, Smugglers. And this is Smugglers. And there is another adobe here. Uh, it's, it's almost identical to the adobe at Scorpion, the very first one we looked at, the one they were working on. But it's back in this grove of trees, and it's hidden. You can't see it from the water. This grove of trees up here, you can see it. It's, it's an orchard. It's been planted. It's, they're not natural. It's a, an olive orchard. They grew olives and exported olives. Um, and that, that olive orchard, since it's historic, it's over 100 years old, so the Park Service keeps it. Um, and they won't take it out. Other things that are not quite so old, they, they throw away. They, they take out. And, and the number is like 50 years or so. If it's more than 50 years old, it's historic, and they have to keep it. If it's less than 50 years old, it's just an I saw and they take it away. Yeah. So the olive orchard is, uh, oh, and uh, one time they spent, when I was uh, uh, volunteering for the Park Service, they spent $300,000 pruning, pruning those olive trees. It, pardon me? Oh, yeah, it's still there. I don't think anybody picks the olives or anything, but they could. But they, they wanted to take care of the trees. And then over on in the Scorpion Ranch, just over the hillside, there was a bunch of cypress trees over there. And cypress trees are not native to the islands, but they're native to the coast of California. They chopped down the cypress trees because they were non-native. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, pardon? Oh. But they're native to California. Yes, they're native to California, but not to the island. And, and I and I asked one of the rangers, "Is this what's, this is crazy?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "You see the difficulty. Different parts of the Park Service have different priorities. The historical people like to keep things. The naturalists, you know, only want things that belong there. <laughs> so it's a it's a dilemma. Anyway, that's that's smugglers." <laughs> Okay, we're going to go on to Santa Rosa Island. There's really only three interesting places. The, uh, the landing, only place you can really land, well, there's two places to land, but this is Kyler's Harbor here. Over here there is uh, it's Johnson's Lee, where you can land, and over here is a shipwreck, which I'll show you a picture of. So this is Beecher's Bay. And this is uh, the, you can't see in the picture, but the, uh, the, the park headquarters is, let's see, there's a, I, I found the pier here the other day in this picture. Pier, I think, is sort of right about in here. And then close to that is a ranger quarters. You can't see it in this picture. But there's, a, there's uh, the old ranch headquarters, then the new ranger uh, quarters. And then this is Skunk Point. And along this beach, again, it doesn't show in the picture, but it's one of the, again, 
wonderful beaches. It's just a, the most beautiful, crisp, clean, white sand. It's just gorgeous. And people go for thousands of miles to find, pay huge amounts of money to find beaches like that. But here's one right here on Santa Rosa Island. The other thing about Santa Rosa Island is, again, the wind blows from the northwest this way. Uh, and the farther west you get on these northern islands, the stronger the wind blows. And this is very low. This is not high at all. It's just, a, you know, 50 feet above sea level. The wind blows across this right through Beecher's Bay. So I don't think we've ever anchored there in less than about 30 knots of wind. So it's uh, not a great anchorage. Right across the way is Forney's, which you just saw a few minutes ago. Right? So Forney's is much better. Then you can just come over here for a day trip. This is from looking up on a, on a hill uh, down toward Beecher's Bay. We're looking toward the north, north or northeast a little bit. So this is Beecher's Bay, and the pier is up in here someplace. Skunk Point is off to your right. But this is Torrey Pines, and I wanted to call your attention to Torrey Pines. Oh, I'm going to get back to Torrey Pines in a minute. This is the old ranch house uh, <clears throat> for the, the main ranch on this island. Uh, this island was, again, also privately owned, and then, the, but the, after the original Mexican owners, there was only one owner, and that was so a two couple, Vale and Vickers. And the Vale and Vickers ran a cattle ranch here for over a hundred years, right, until the 1980s. Uh, they, they sold it to the Park Service, uh, and this was the main ranch house. This is reputed to be the oldest wooden home in California. It's built in 1848 or 1849. This is a ranger village. This is a ran they, the rangers also have the nicest houses. I got to stay in this one right here. So this is quite nice. And this is real luxurious. Just a little apartment. I've got a bedroom and a kitchen and a little sitting room. Santa Rosa also was unique, and it's the, you, you can't, if it's too big, uh, there's too much, things are too spread out, and you can't really walk to anything interesting from the beach uh, or from even the, from the pier where the Packers let people walk. So the Park Service has these big four wheel drive vehicles and take people around the island in these vehicles. So that was when, when you're a volunteer there, that's one of your jobs. You, you go on tours and you get to drive around. You can see these people in this, uh, this little, that's a, that's a Chevy. Blazer, I think. Suburban, I don't know. It's a big four-wheel drive thing anyway. And, uh, uh, but where we're at is a place called Torrey Pines. And that is a Torrey Pine up close. They have very coarse, long needles. And Torrey Pines used to be common uh, 5,000, 10,000 years ago, up and down the whole coast of California. Now the only Torrey Pines are here and in San Diego, the place that goes by the name Torrey Pines. Right? This is a much healthier grove than the one in San Diego. The one in San Diego, because of pollution, is not doing so well. This one is extremely healthy. So this may be the last Torrey Pines in the world in a while. Uh, there's another interesting place. Again, it's five or six miles from the from the ranger station, so you have to get there in this vehicle. But it's called Lobo Canyon, and there's two or three canyons on the north side of the island, deep canyon. There's another one called Arlington Canyon, and have you heard of Arlington Man or Arlington Woman? The oldest human remains in the United in the North America and well, in the Western Hemisphere, for that matter, were found right here in Arlington Canyon. And the bone is just a thigh bone, and uh, that's all, and it's, it's ultimately a man or a woman. They change every few years, but it's 13,000 years old. So it's the oldest human that's been found on the, on the, on the Americas. Right. Oh, so it's quite interesting. And also the pygmy mammoth, if you go to the, the, to the museum out there in Spinnaker Drive in Ventura, uh, that little model of the, the, the real mammoth, the bones of the mammoth are in the Santa Barbara Museum. The one in Ventura is a model, but it was found in Arlington Canyon as well. So you can see when you go down, uh, you, first of all, then you go through these little pin oaks, which are just little sort of dwarf kind of oak trees, very picturesque, uh, beautiful rock formations. But these are the kind of things, uh, if you go with, a, with an archaeologist, they'll be able to find a mammoth bone for you in a half an hour. Right? They're apparently just all over the place. <laughs> I've never been able to find one or even see one, but that's the rumor. And it goes all the way down to the beach. It's about a two-mile walk. There's a bunch of people that we walked down to the beach. 
And I don't, I didn't keep the picture. Uh, I was trying to cut the time down, but there's a, and I think it may be right here, but I'm not positive. But there's a, a midden, and the midden is, is quite far from the surface, and it's about three feet thick. A midden is basically a fancy word for a garbage heap. And the Chumash Indians, where well, they would they ate mostly seafood because there was a lot of it, and they would you know they would eat their abalones and their clams, and they would just throw the shells over their shoulder, and and over a thousand years that would build up a pretty good layer of it. Right? And so there was a beautiful midden down there with these abalone shells and clam shells and stuff coming out, and just solid shells, you know, so thick. Uh, but I think I took the picture out. Okay, things that aren't here anymore. <laughs> This is a, there was an Air Force base on Santa Rosa Island. This is over when Johnson's Lee on the south side. And when we first started boating up there, it was there. There's a, there's a radar station, and they were looking for Russian airplanes that were going to bomb Los Angeles. And, uh, and so all these people were there to support this radar station. And uh, may you get the right button. There we are in the officers' club. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, this was less than 50 years old. The Park Service says it's got to go, so they bulldozed it. <laughs> uh, so there's nothing there anymore. Uh, this is another thing that's not there anymore. The Park Service didn't take it away. It just simply rusted away. Uh, I didn't take this picture, but when we first started boating, the boat was pretty much intact. It was pretty much a whole boat. We never actually stopped and got out this close to it. Uh, the weather's terrible there. You know, that's, up, that's up the channel between the two islands, between San, San Miguel and Santa Rosa. Uh, but this was the SS Chickasaw, and it ran aground uh, in, a, in a storm one time, and I don't know, the 50s, I guess. And uh, by by the 80s, it was just about disappeared. And it just rusted away to nothing. And now you can't see anything. Okay, now we're going to go to San Miguel, the last island. And I think how we're doing on time. We're just about right. Uh, this is Kyler's Harbor. And... I showed you the nicest beach on Santa Rosa or Santa Cruz Island, uh, and that was Coaches Priados. This is the nicest beach in Southern California. <laughs> this whole uh, anchorage, this is probably a mile and a half across there. It's really, really big, and it, oh, this is all beautiful white sand all the way along. And this is the most gorgeous, sugary, white, clean sand you ever saw. The wind blows fiercely up there. You can see the streaks of sand that are blown up off onto the hillside. And when you come in, there's rocks all over the place. This one, of course, is so big. I mean, it's really an island. There's a rock there, and a rock there, and a rock there, and a rock there, and a rock there. Fortunately, most of these rocks are above the water, so they're fairly easy to see. But, you know, but if the weather's bad, you've got to check your charts. Let me just back up one time. Uh, there's a, this, this cliff for this mountain here is 200 feet high, perhaps. It's pretty high. So if you tuck right in in here, uh, the 40 knot winds don't bother you too much. But, <laughs> but it always blows there, and it blows really, really hard. I've been there a couple of times where it was calm, but you can't really count on it. So anyway, the, the best anchorage is tucked right up in here, as close to the hill as you can get. And that's it. That's as you go in. And you can see some of these rocks. There's a rock. There's a rock. But they're pretty easy to see if it's good weather. And you wouldn't want to go up there when it's not good weather. Now you can get some idea how nice that beach is. Uh, of course, you have to land your dinghy on the beach and tow it up. And this further beach down here, this has been taken over by elephant seals. And uh, we're expecting the elephant seals will eventually move on to this beach as well. The population is increasing. They keep looking for new places to go. And if the elephant seals take over this beach, then the island's going to have to be closed for two or three months a year out of each year. Uh, and this is the Yacht Club cruise, and uh, there we are walking up the sanding. And again, if you could see it close, I'd say it's just beautiful. You can just see how it's so white and fine, and I said, just really just beautiful sand, hard to walk in. This is the Rodriguez, Rodriguez, uh, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, the Cabrillo Monument. Down here, if you can't read it, 
discoverer of California in 1542. In this museum, we've got some models, and there's a, there's a replica of the Cabrillo. In fact, there's a really nice exhibit of Cabrillo landing in California, back in the back somewhere there. And uh, there's a replica of his ship that's been here, that comes here every year. Uh, it says Portuguese navigator, and it says Isle of Burial, 1543. Well, this is wrong on several accounts. For it turns out, and, and the reason this, it says J O A O, this is a Portuguese way to say Juan, right? And this is this was done by the uh, oh, Isle of Burial, yeah, the Cabrillo uh, something Civic Clubs. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Cabrillo Civic Club. Anyway, there's a lot of Portuguese fishermen around, and the Portuguese put this up here for Cabrillo. Well, it turned out Cabrillo was really Spanish. It wasn't Portuguese at all. <laughs> and, and so this spelling should be Juan, <laughs> should be right. And he's not necessarily buried on this island. They don't know where he's buried. Nobody has ever found uh, Cabrillo's burial spot. He did die on the islands, almost certainly. He, he fell and broke either an arm or leg. I, I'm not quite sure which was correct, but it was a compound fracture, and of course then you get a deep infection, and in those days there was no way to, to treat an infection like that, and he almost invariably died from it, and he did. He got, became infected, and he died uh, on the islands, but he, he is the discoverer, given credit, as the discoverer of California, 1542. So this is his monument, but it's not his gravesite. <laughs> okay, this is where, this is really the end. How to get there? Channel Islands Air, I don't think out of Camarillo, will fly you to Santa Rosa Island. There's a little airstrip, and uh, uh, right by, well, oh, by the shore, they don't have a map. But, but you can land on the island in Santa Rosa. Uh, the uh, docent will pick you up in one of those big vans, take you around the island. You can do that. You can go by private boat, of course, which I did for so many years, Ted and I and Sandy. Um, Truth Aquatics out of Santa Barbara takes trips over, and in Ventura, Island Packers. And really, they I, I highly recommend the Island Packers. This is the National Park Headquarters in Ventura. You probably have all seen it. You see the park boats. This is the Island Packers. They're just down a little bit from the Park Service uh, out on Spinnaker Drive. And they are really nice people. It's a family-owned business. And the Connellys are the nicest people you can possibly imagine. And they give you really good service. And, uh, you know, they take you. You can go for a day. You can camp. You can go for a week. Uh, whatever you want. You can get a kayak over on Santa Cruz. They go to almost all the islands. They go to Santa Barbara only a couple times in the summer. San Miguel a couple times in the summer. Mostly to Anacapa and Santa Cruz. And occasionally to Santa Rosa. So, anyway, the Packers is a great way to get there. That's their boat, those 90-foot catamarans. They'll get you over there in a big hurry. They don't rock and roll. They're just rock stable. Uh, and that's the end of it. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I'll see you next month. Okay.